So I think that there's no one yet in our session. So I guess we should wait until we see some people log in. There we have, let's see, we have one. Some folks are, so welcome. Uh, oh, and Faisal, could you mute uh, until you're speaking? Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go, thanks. So for those who are joining, we'll start in just a minute. Uh, we welcome you to this discussion on religious tolerance masked by political intolerance. We'll be having a very interesting conversations with some uh, really leading experts from the world on, uh, on this intersection between uh, religion and other identities, whether it's politics, uh, business, um, you know, other main players in the world. Uh, so again, I'll uh, introduce myself. I'm Brian Grimm, uh, president of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation. Uh, we're based in the United States, but work worldwide. One of our signature events is the Global Business and Interfaith Peace Awards, uh, which we honor business leaders who are advancing uh, the values of interfaith understanding, uh, religious freedom broadly defined, and peace. Uh, so today uh, we'll be having our, th our three experts, uh, David Miller from Princeton University, uh, Sarah Snyder, who uh, with the Rose Castle Foundation and works with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Faisal uh, bin Muanmar, who's the Secretary General of Kaisen. Uh, so we'll turn to each of those uh, in turn. So just as a general uh, overview of this topic, faith is uh, something near and dear to more than almost nine out of 10 people in the world today uh, are ascribed to a religious faith. And for many of them, it's a source of comfort. It's a source of solace. President Biden uh, often speaks very personally about how his own Catholic faith uh, influences not only his policies, but is a great source of personal support. Uh, he carries a rosary bead everywhere he goes and prays the rosary he, I think, almost never misses Sunday Mass. So for politicians, religion is something personal, but also um, faith is something personal, but faith can also be used as a divisive topic. Uh, so in uh, around the world, whether it's uh, religion-related conflicts, sectarian conflicts, um, these, these things play out sometimes on our TV screens or, or computer screens as we watch the news. Um, so how can we overcome this negative aspect where religion is used as something uh, that divides rather than unifies? And politicians are always looking to build a coalition and support their case. And if they can cozy up to a religious community, um, that's something that uh, either in democracies wins them votes or in non-democracies wins them alliances that keep them in power. So uh, we're going to turn first uh, to Sarah Snyder, uh, Canon Sarah, Sarah Snyder. And uh, Sarah, so introduce yourself a little bit more and then, um, and then you go ahead and uh, give your thoughts of how these divisions could be overcome if possible. And remember to unmute. Thank you, Brian. Greetings, everybody. Um, I've been working in uh, conflict uh, context for about 30, 40 years uh, all around the world, but always in a faith-based context. Um, I work as a Christian personally, but I'm uh, generally working in either Abrahamic communities or, or communities where the Abrahamic faiths are intersecting with other um, religious identities. We, I lead something called the Rose Castle Foundation, which is committed to training the next generation of leaders to really understanding those um, religious nuances that become super important when we're dealing with uh, significant crises, particularly violent crises. And we actually operate out of a castle that itself um, symbolizes that conflict. Uh, it's on the Scottish English border. Uh, it's 800 years old. It was uh, it witnessed um, conflict between the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, uh, but it also witnessed significant conflict between the Scots and the English. Uh, it's a fortified castle with a moat, um, but it's been a house of prayer for 800 years, and we've reopened it as a place of prayer that seeks to unite enemies rather than um, uh, promote their divisiveness. So 
this topic is absolutely the heart of what we're about. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the multifaceted communities that we live in, culturally, racially, ideologically, politically, economically, just to name a few, um, and, and always marked by challenging differences within our families and households, let alone in the wider community. And these differences matter to us. They often define us and others like us. Our different perspectives motivate and inform us as we make decisions about our lives or respond to other people's decisions about our lives. So these differences are important to us. We cannot and should not try to cover or delete them under the banner of a super ideology, no matter how moral or ethical that ideology is. Rather, we can seek to express our shared values through the differing lenses and languages of our diverse ideological frameworks. And there will be some values that we simply do not share, no matter how hard we try. So it's better to be explicit about these fundamental differences in outlook than to pretend otherwise. Very often, by transparently exploring them in the presence of others who disagree with us, we actually discover new ways of articulating and acting out our core values, ways that bring us together rather than move us apart. So uh, take the word tolerance, for example. Translated into some languages, including Arabic perhaps, it might inspire an admiral attitude of generosity towards another who is different. In English, however, it means a kind of half-hearted putting up with another, not a quality I, for one, would want to encourage in my children. In fact, many of us long for more than tolerance so defined. We might prefer even to encourage a risky act of hospitality towards strangers and outsiders to our community. So just uh, touch on what can the state do to encourage such such kind of hospitality, especially in our COVID world in which health, jobs, relationships, the whole fabric of society as we know it has been so uprooted. Well, Challengingly, it might start by modeling a radically different kind of hospitality across our own political parties, assessing colleagues across the spectrum on the basis of their contribution to society rather than relentlessly attacking their personhood. It could model hospitality through its actions towards uh, religious and other minorities within our borders and to refugees and asylum seekers beyond them. It might recognize the social contribution of faith actors at the heart of our communities, resourcing rather than reducing opportunities for responsible faith-based action. It might perhaps, perhaps shift education about people of faith within our schools, colleges, universities, and places of work, introducing our young people to actual members of those living faith communities rather than teaching generalizations about them. And it might encourage dialogue and action across its multiple societal divides by supporting organizations and curricula that actively seek diverse encounter and collaboration. So in all these ways and many more, it would model a very different norm to the one we're used to, a norm in which people are respected and valued rather than attacked and undermined. This would require a shift not only in our governments and institutions, but also in our parenting, grandparenting, and other informal inductions of young children into the social norms of the world we all grow up in. Children learn by watching the adults above them. So we all have to identify ways in which we can exemplify a better quality of disagreement with those who are different to ourselves. In doing so, we'll discover that shared humanity this panel is asked to reflect on. We cannot insist on it or even teach it. We have to model it. The concept of covenantal pluralism, which I hope we'll discuss a little bit more, embraces this. We are not the same, but we need to work together shoulder to shoulder, supporting one another in our differences for the sake of the common good. I have to unmute myself. Thank you, sir. I, I love that concept of hospitality as a, a value as opposed to something like tolerance. Just even in one word, just using a different word can change the whole discussion because when you think of hospitality, that, that just opens up a whole new level of human, human interaction. Um, and then- and that, on that note, I was gonna say, yeah. I think 
with hospitality. It's this idea of risky hospitality where it's more about being other people's guest than always being the host because there's this power dynamic that goes on. And we yeah. often think we've got to be good hosts, which we do, but we've also got to be other people's guests. That's even more important, I think. So. That's, a, that's a great point. Yeah, we, I raised our four kids, and now you mentioned grandparenting. We have a bunch of grand uh, grandkids. And our kids were born in China and raised in Soviet Central Asia and the Middle East. And we often felt like hus we were, uh, we, you know, that the hospitality was overwhelming. And so to be part of that hospitality in ways that we could never replicate was humbling, but also broadened our world and, and changed our perspectives on people. So I, I think that's a great point you make. It's not about being the person giving the hospitality, but also being open to hospitality. Uh, great points. So we're going to move now to uh, uh, Faisal bin Muammar, who is uh, the Secretary General of Kaisid. Um, and more than Kaisid, he's worked in government and uh, for many years and uh, is at the center of these discussions. So um, Faisal, tell us a little bit more about uh, your work, uh, and then how you approach this topic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. I would like to thank you and thank uh, the crisis community uh, for uh, giving me the chance to participate tonight with uh, our friends here. And it's really lovely to talk about this because if I go back to my memory, you know, and uh, where I started the program, you know, uh, uh, when I was traveling to the United States in 1985, you know, after the Gulf crisis and so many things, the Iranian revolution, and, uh, you know, thinking about religion and politics and how the West is seeing uh, or uh, believing in the separation between religion and the state. But, you know, the first dollar I, I, I looked at it and I remember seeing in God we trust then I know that I am going to uh, a community where they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, their belief, and uh, which is really uh, encouraging for me to to understand the culture and the way they live. But you know, I was fortunate to start in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia by working in education and building the national dialogue of Saudi Arabia. So I dealt with sectarian issues, especially between Sunnah and Shia. And it was really an interesting journey for me, you know, to know how we can live together. And uh, we opened the books of history and we went back to the de Declaration of Medina. We, uh, 1400 years when the Declaration of Medina was done by Prophet Muhammad and uh, it, it has 58 items, which is if you can commission the biggest uh, law office I don't know if they can create at that time, you know. So it is uh, the way it, I saw it is how to live with the others, how to create a community living together, although they have different religions. Uh, I was fortunate also to be asked uh, to establish Kai Seed in Vienna. When we start the work in, in Vienna, uh, I remember, you know, dealing with the, with the uh, you know, maybe I, I, I will, it's not funny, but you know, the first time I shake hand with the rabbi, it was in Kaisid, you know, in my life. So it was interesting, you know, to know uh, our brothers from uh, Jewish and Christian and Buddhist and Hindus. Uh, we started the journey to uh, work in a field where it is not easy between where we come from and uh, the life in, in the Western civilization where there is a total separation between religion and the state. But as you mentioned uh, uh, rightly, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, all the, the policymakers, they have their own belief and it influenced their decision somehow. And we remember during the crisis, whether it's, uh, you know, during the Afghan crisis or the others, when uh, the president of the United States used religious phrases, you know, to, to, to talk about, uh, the way they deal with with the uh, uh, religious issue. One of the things we have, uh, I remember, you know, uh, during the establishment of Kaisid, we discovered something. Maybe we never talked about it. That religion is it part of the solution or the cause of the problem? And this was really something I 
uh, it influenced me and I started thinking about it all the way, you know, how really we can switch from uh, 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 misusing the religion to be part of the solution. W recognizing that 84% of the population of the world, they have a certain belief. So what to do with it? We were fortunate enough at KC that we were the only intergovernmental institutions where we have three countries by their political umbrella, uh, uh, the founding states, and we have a board of director from multi-faith uh, uh, origins. So it was really uh, amazing how we can connect religion to uh, support policymaker. And that was not easy also. We went through difficulties and I can, I was uh, just before we, we start this uh, meeting, I said I can publish a book about my experience with politicians when I started trying to talk to them about inter-religious dialogue. And believe it or not, when I was trying to contact policymakers in Europe, some of them, they didn't want to see me even in their offices. They sometimes make an appointment with me to see me at a cafe because they don't want to associate themselves with religion. So it is interesting to see how we uh, keep distance from faith or religion and we uh, didn't really use the power of religion to help establish peace in the world. The first word we use in Islam is Assalamu Alaikum, and it is for us peace be upon the uh, all. Uh, it means that if I live with you, or you are my neighbor, you live in my community, you are my brother, no matter where you come from. It is really the concept we try to introduce to everybody. I came from the Kingdom from Saudi, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where it hosts the, the two holy mosques leading the Islamic world. So we have a noble responsibility to tell everybody in the world that we are, uh, we are uh, introducing the religion or using religion as a mean of uh, uh, coexistence, of living together, of uh, peace, of so many things. I believe now with all the political crises in the world and uh, all the crises we are going uh, with, especially the pandemic, uh, crisis. I believe that we are uh, we ought to encourage the concept of equal citizenship, and that's really very important for us to think about it. If we think about it and build everything upon equal citizenship, that will help a lot. You know, to to bring religious leaders to support all the rules and law, you know, related to the issue of living together. So this is how I see it. So in, in some of your conversations you had with politicians, what, uh, can you identify anything that, um, what, what helped them see the light that engaging with religion was actually something that could be beneficial? You know, I think what helped them because there were a lot of failures of every military and uh, political solution. So uh, there is no way to escape from using religion to help, you know, and this is really a fact, you know, because I've seen it, it's growing. Now there is a lot of interest now, and so many are calling us, asking for our help, and to, to, to try to, uh, to uh, train themselves or adapt to this as in their foreign policy. And we've seen it in the United States, we've seen it in, uh, in uh, many European countries, and inter-religious dialogue now, now becoming part of their policy. I think you're muted, Brian. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you, Faisal, excellent. Um, I'm having a big thunderstorm here, so if my internet goes off, uh, uh, my apologies. So next, we, I want to hear from uh, uh, David Miller, who works uh, on the connection between faith and business, but really how faith principles can can help uh, redeem situations. Uh, so David, share a little bit about your work and then uh, some of the principles that you've seen that are effective in overcoming these uh, uh, where religion seems like a divisive issue. Right. 
Well, first, let me echo, uh, as others have, my appreciation to uh, uh, our hosts, Oasis and Brian, to, as usual, your uh, stellar moderation. Sarah, delight to be with you again and to meet Faisal. So let me start with that. Uh, my uh, br briefly, what what qualifies or disqualifies me to be part of this conversation is uh, I, I've had different chapters in my life. Uh, some people call me bilingual as a metaphor. I was in the corporate world and senior executive positions internationally for several years, and then I made a shift to study theology, and, uh, uh, and I teach now at Princeton University, uh, and I'm particularly focused on the question of religion and the marketplace. So religion and politics is something normally I politely circumvent, uh, and now you, you're, you're outing me here. So uh, I'll jump in with, with two feet. First, I want to strongly echo uh, the point, Sarah, you made. I, I, words matter. Uh, and, of course, we trend it into different countries with different languages differently. But in the English language, both American English and, and real English in the U.K., the, the, the word tolerance to me is, is really an unacceptable word. And I understand how we started with that in the, the history of, uh, of this uh, of tolerance of different views, but it's really I deign to allow you to have your view. I deign you to come and sit at the table with me. It's still my table. I'm still in charge, but I'll permit you to be here. I, I the word I like to use is respect. Uh, that this is about this is a question of respect. I could profoundly disagree with your view on politics, on your favorite sports team, or your religion, but I can still respect you for having those views. So, so number one, I, I, I'd like to hope, I hope we can move from tolerance to respect as a part of our vocabulary, and it might vary from language to language, but, but I throw that into the conversation. Uh, also, maybe counterintuitively, having, thinking back to my corporate world, and even to some extent in the, market, in the world of academia, when ideas clash against each other, you, you can either be stubborn and just keep articulating your view, viewpoint louder and louder, or sometimes friction can lead to a certain fraternity, a certain growth, uh, uh, sort of a new idea emerging, or maybe even you're right and I'm wrong, or there's some better truth if I join the things together. So, so I, I, friction isn't necessarily bad. Uh, if we approach it with ideas of hospitality and grace and genuinely listening. Uh, what, what, one thing I, I think about a lot is, is so, and maybe this can help the political sphere if that's part of our title, is is the, uh, to me, the, the marketplace, the world of business, and it doesn't matter if it's, if it's tech, if it's agricultural business, if it's uh, finance, if it's manufacturing, the world of the marketplace is the laboratory for new ideas. It's the laboratory for new ideas. And you get the best minds, the most creative people, whether they're 28 years old or 68 years old, they are building and running businesses and challenging the status quo. So they're the ones that have to deal with questions, uh, social questions for the first time ahead of their governments. And many of these businesses are international businesses. So questions of gender, gender orientation, religious identity, skin color, ethnicity, uh, these are hot issues and sometimes very controversial. And businesses, they don't always get it right, of course, but, but they're getting better and better at how do I do this in both Boston and Bahrain? How do I do this in Detroit and Dubai? How do I do this in Shanghai and in New York City? They're learning how to do that. So I would submit to this conversation that we can, uh, and our governments can learn a lot because our governments want their own national-based businesses to, to flourish, and governments all want to invite foreign capital and foreign businesses to come in to help grow their economies. So it's, it's one of those rare bi-directional or multi-directional resources that I think goes untapped. Uh, and where those, uh, and Faisal, you and Sarah are much better equipped than me, but for those who, who swim in that space of the go and have the government ear and accents to different people, uh, one idea might be let's bring in more of our CEOs, our big entrepreneurs, our those who are running, uh, be it small, medium, or large businesses, and I'll bet they've got some answers to these questions, and I'll bet they're kind of frustrated that they haven't been, because they're doing it already. And it, yeah, it might be clumsy, it's not perfect, but it's better better than nothing. Uh, w w one example that, uh, that, that I want to throw forward is I liked how, how um, Faisal, you said that there's power in religion to help solve problems. I mean, religion, in addition to its personal piety and devotional practices, well, there's a reason. It, it works. People's lives are better. They, they, they have healthier, better quality lives if they adhere to the teachings of their, their faith tradition, whatever that tradition might be. 
So, so an organization I do some advisory work for, it's an international company based in Europe, and they were really wrestling with the question of trust. They were saying, no one trusts us. Well, there's reasons that exist that aren't worth going into. And they said, what do you think about it? And I was advising them on ethics, because I'm also an ethicist as well as a theologian. And I said, well, I don't know what your view of religion is, but if you look at some of the world's great religions, that's, at its best, religions are all about trust. When there's a breach of trust, when you're using old-fashioned language, when you've sinned against God or sinned against your neighbor, you've harmed somebody, you've disappointed somebody, you've let someone down, you've injured someone. Well, all these traditions uh, have a pathway back to wholeness, a pathway back to healing, a pathway back to... To, to rebuilding trust. So we did a study looking at focusing on the three traditions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and saying, what do these three traditions have? And surprise, surprise, like a Venn diagram, a massive amount of, of, of overlap. Yes, different vocabulary, different uh, protocols, if you will, different uh, rituals, but all of them had a way back to healing. And we came up with 11 principles, and now this is published. And business documents, even the World Economic Forum, wanted to hear about it. So, so that, that's just one example on the question of trust that we all struggle with. How do we restore trust, uh, whether it's governments or corporate people? And some of the original answers come from our religious traditions. Uh, so I, I throw that into the mix, and maybe there's food for thought there. Well, I, I, I love that idea that you put out the business. Uh, I like to call it the crossroads of creativity and com commerce. You know, you've got yeah. this commerce, commercial innovation going on. And in order to succeed in the market, you've got to be creative. You've got to find that next solution for whatever the problem is out there. Yeah. Um, and, and businesses are doing that. And so there's, they're just built into the system of business this idea of, of solving problems. So I, I want to just drill down a little bit deeper into the last thing you said of, uh, of this paper you produced for a company, uh, helping them on, back on the road to trust. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can speak to the impact that, that uh, paper, that research is having. Um, uh, you know, do you have a sense that other businesses are interested in that? And if so, you know, what's the best way to connect with businesses on this very topic? You know, you suggest that we do it. So how do we do it? Yeah. So, I mean, one, uh, uh, if anyone ever wants to contact me, obviously they can contact me. I can send them a link and send a PDF of the paper. We're reissuing it with a new forward. Uh, I was part of the Values 20 group that some of you will know uh uh, hosted uh, by the King of Saudi Arabia last year, and we talked about that as one of the things. So it's beginning to get some oxygen uh, in uh, in different countries through different networks, uh, and people are reading it, and they're curious. And to be sure, there's a little bit of anxiety whenever you, in the corporate world, mention the word religion. Some people will gasp, but after they realize it's not a, about re being, it's not about religiosity, it's about good ideas. That's what it's about. And that's when people start saying, oh my gosh, and if it works amongst these three traditions, and of course others as well, we just limit it to those three for scope and scale. We cover uh, well over half the world's population with some of these ideas. Um, it, and I might add that that what we're seeing, and Brian, I know you know this, but for those who are listening who may not think about uh, religion or faith or spirituality in the, in the corporate sphere, companies that are going public with saying as part of their diversity inclusion program that this is something that matters to them, surprise, surprise, they're attracting and retaining the best people because people say, oh, I could bring my whole self to work. I don't have to be embarrassed that my religion teaches me that I need to pray X number of times a day or I can't touch certain products or certain days of the week I can't do certain things, that they're delighted to know that, okay, that's all right. We'll find a way to accommodate, assuming it doesn't totally disrupt the flow of the business. Well, gosh, those are the places you want to go work. So even if you're uh, an atheist or an agnostic and or even hostile to religion, I'd suggest there's some really special things done the right way that come out of religious ideas in the corporate world, at least, and maybe others. Well, I think that, I mean, there, I know a lot of examples of that, but just um, just the idea you brought in of atheism. So uh, some of the work that we do is we include atheists uh, intentionally as part of our interfaith uh, dialogue. It's and a worldview, isn't it? Yeah. If, if you're, you, 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 you're choosing what you believe in as a worldview. And if I don't believe in some theistic higher power, that's fine. I believe yeah. in science or that which I could touch, see, feel, measure. 
that's a that's a faith. That's a religion with maybe a, another way of thinking of it. You're, I, I think I, it's terrific you include that. Yeah, and I think then that makes it it makes it inclusive. You know, working in that diversity and inclusive space, and and we've had this the executive director of the Secular Coalition of America explicitly ask to be included in interfaith dialogue. That's great. So so we, when we assume that faith doesn't have anything to say to the government or to business or even to people without faith, we're making assumptions that aren't necessarily shared by the people we're assuming, making the assumption about. <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah, let, let's come back to you for some more thoughts. Just a few thoughts. Thank you, everybody. A rich discussion um, on trust and actually, uh, you know, this very word corporate and the idea that trust is a relational um, concept. Trust requires more than myself. You um, trust someone because you believe they're acting on a principle that is not just for themselves. Um, and I think there's there's more that we can um, learn from the faith traditions, the religious traditions, and other actually ideological long-term traditions that have a communal aspect to them, that have a built-in system for assessing how we understand and rely on communal decision-making. Um, and I think that kind of aspect to trust is really important for us to dig deeper into. Something that the religious traditions have a lot to say on. <laughs> Well, I, one of the areas I work a lot in is religious freedom. And um, even in my own faith tradition, it used to be Baptist and then I became Catholic. And and so the, I exercised religious freedom in my own life, you could say. But in my Catholic tradition, there's a, a broader concept that in my faith, Jesus came and what he did, he suffered for all the wrongs that are happening so that we could um, have a better more loving relationship with God, you know, sort of putting it simply. And that belief in the sort of Catholic ideas, that applies to everybody. What Jesus did was something for everybody, whether you believe it or not, whether uh, you have a different belief about it or not, we can't really change what what God did. So it gives a greater freedom to work with everybody because then I can learn something from atheists. I can learn something from uh, people of different religions than mine because, you know, I, I have a belief that God is sort of bigger than bigger than these religions that we have. Um, so, Faisal, you, I mean, you're working with people of all different beliefs and, and faiths. So how have you found this dialogue between faiths, sort of multi-faith dialogue? Uh, how has it been changing in recent years? Is it the same as it was 20 years ago? Or have you seen new developments? No, I think uh, we are uh, witnessing uh, a revolution in, uh, in the interfaith business. I mean, it's really, we. Uh, I, I couldn't believe, you know, what we are seeing now around the world. One of the best examples is that the United Nations itself is recognizing the role of uh, multi-faith uh, uh, organizations. And uh, they, it's really, uh, uh, they just, uh, w many international organizations are calling to, 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 to see how uh, faith is, uh, or interfaith is really contributing to so many things. Uh, you know, going back to the world of trust, you know, I think ideally we can really see business, for example, as a bridge between religion and politics. And it could be really nice to see how uh, uh, it's not only building bridges. We want to cross the bridge to the other side. I, that means we, we have to move. You cannot, uh, you know, when, when you believe in dialogue and you adopt dialogue, there is no way to exclude, to say, atheist or something, you know, they are not part of your community. I mean, they have their uh, own belief. They have their own uh, way of dealing with the with the with the with the, with the issues in, in in life so it is the, this way i uh, and being now in this business i see now that uh, the, the challenge is really how to cross the psychological barriers and to go to the stage of building trust and to build the trust there is no way to uh, accomplish any success without uh, that are recognizing it from the uh, from uh, politicians and policymakers. Policymakers are the one who drive the 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 the, the 
policy of the whole world, whether it's uh, influencing business or religion. So what we should really do is how we uh, convince them to see this, as I said in the beginning, to believe that they c- it can be part of the solution, it can help, it can be... You know, I, I, I wonder sometimes, we always think that uh, it's good to be in a, a faithful uh, family and to, to be connected to a certain faith. But when it comes to decision-making or uh, to create policies around the world, we say, no, we have to separate ourselves and we don't want to really uh, issue, uh, connect this to, to, uh, to uh, faith or religion. I, I, I think there is a huge room of, uh, of uh, success now. I seen now um, one example of our work. We are now training fellows around the world. And when we started, there were a few fellows are, uh, you know, uh, engaging with us. Uh, lately, we celebrated graduating more than 500 graduates. We call them ambassador of dialogue from 59 countries. Yes. So, I, I, just thinking of you know, what bringing business into the discussion, I want to go back to David. Um, one of the concepts that David mentioned in, the, in a lot of the work that I do is in this uh, corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion space. So businesses are now uh, moving towards not just including uh, racial identities or sexual identities or <clears throat> other kinds of identities, but also religion is part of that. And I, so I'm going to flip it back to the politics. Maybe this approach, this new movement in business, could be something that governments could learn about because, um, you know, how do you bring in those diverse voices? And, and, and I, I'm going to just finish it with this and then throw it to you, David. Sarah mentioned this concept of covenantal pluralism where we all agree that what your beliefs are really matter to you. And I want to defend your right to be able to hold them, but I don't necessarily by doing that say, I agree with you. You know, I, 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 that's that sort of rich pluralism. And so sort of within governments, you know, would this diversity, equity, inclusion movement within businesses that's now starting to include religion. I wonder if that might have something to teach governments. Maybe it's the first time, you know, I, I'm sure it's the first time you've been asked that question, David, so I'm putting you on the spot. But, you know, think about it. You know, is there something, you know, from the business world where they're work, starting to work in some companies for a lot of decades even working on this, that could be helpful in the political discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is is yes. Uh, so, but, but how do we actualize that? How, how do we make that happen? How do we operationalize it. And of course, every country is going to have its own government structure, its own history, its own sources of power and decision making and governance. So the, 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 how does one start that discussion in different countries? Each country is going to have to figure out its own solution. And some of them may not want to have that conversation. Some people might be afraid of it, frankly, that they might feel it undermines their uh, the status quo or existing power or the existing coalitions. Uh, but I understand that. Um, so I, I think we're talking about something that's bold, uh, and, and like many bold ideas, the, the great ones are bold. Uh, and, and organizations, just like organizations that are starting this conversation, I think they will reap massive commercial benefits from it, employee benefits, uh, creativity benefits, and so forth. By way of analogy, if, if different governments are not afraid of it, I think they will as well. But we know is I think, a factual matter that not every government wants to have this conversation. And that's where I really defer to uh, you know, Sarah and, and Faisal, you who've been in this game, this game, this business a long time. And it takes patience. And I respect that. Uh, you can't just flip a switch and uh, expect a, a certain uh, system will, will change. And maybe the system doesn't need to change, but the people who lead the system need to change. So it might be a multi-generational discussion uh, as much as we'd like it to happen tomorrow. And by the way, that that e- even countries that are very open to challenging ideas uh, and public ideas, uh, they we have our problems too. So it's I'm not just uh, referring to governments other than my own. We have our challenges too. Well, we have we have just uh, three more minutes. 
one minute closing comment from uh, each. If somebody takes three minutes, then the other two don't get a closing comment. So, Sarah, we will start with you. Any last thoughts? Jumping in without time to think, Brian, but just to say um, uh, a challenge is uh, the role of the media in all of our organizations. We haven't touched on that, not just uh, mainstream media, but social media, uh, the way in which we are increasingly blinkered in our ability to see two or more sides of a divide because we're only being fed one side of that divide. And we believe that represents all sides of every divide. Um, and we need to challenge that at governmental level. Uh, Faisal, I'm going to give you the last word because you asked for it. So, David, any last thought? And then I'll just repeat my one sentence. I think the, the business world, the corporate world writ large, is the laboratory of ideas. Some yeah. fail, some succeed. And let's let this one go into multiple laboratories and see what happens. Okay, Faisal? Yeah, I think there is, there is a, a huge room for improvement. I believe that uh, we should really eliminate ignorance, and I think this is really one of the issues, and uh, uh, encourage uh, the, uh, education and knowing the others. Uh, I believe it is uh, really uh, one of the things the policymaker and the international organization can contribute hugely in this business, and we can do so many things to save the whole world. The pandemic crisis uh, proved to us that uh, we have one enemy and we have to really unite against this enemy. And now it is a hidden enemy, so we have to be careful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Faisal, Sarah, David. Uh, as always, a great conversation. Thank and, and thanks for those who tuned in and who will watch the recording. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>